Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is C Raptor, and today we're going to kick off a new Learn to Play series, this time taking a look at that other old line in World of Warships. Having recently done uh, a Learn to Play for the American Heavy Cruisers, let's take a look at the Japanese Heavy Cruisers, one of the original lines of cruisers here in World of Warships. It's been, well, we're coming up on you know, more than eight years since open beta, coming up on eight years since initial release. And the Japanese heavy cruisers remain a really, really interesting, really solid line of ships in World of Warships. Now, the top end of the line has not aged as well as their American counterparts. And we'll talk about, you know, we get to Zal, we get to Ibuki, we'll talk about why I feel like that is the case. But down here at the beginning, right, we're in the middle tiers, tier 5, tier 6, tier 7. These ships are as relevant today as they were when the game launched. In fact, in some cases, they're better today than they were when the game launched. And um, yeah, these are some really, really good ships, some really fun ships to play. And of course, we have to talk about the eternal conundrum that is Mogami when we get to tier 8. But for today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start with tier 5's Furutaka. Furutaka is, well, Furutaka is unique in World of Warships. She is the only, the only Tier 5 Tech Tree heavy cruiser in World of Warships. Now, we've talked about this in some of the other lines we've discussed, right? What is the technical difference between heavy and light cruiser? If you're not familiar with the terminology or the, the naval treaties of the era, the short, short version is this. A light cruiser generally in World of Warships, uh, well, historically, um, had six-inch diameter or less guns. So if you look at a ship like a Cleveland or an Atlanta, those ships had uh, six- and five-inch diameter guns, respectively. They were considered light cruisers under the terms of the various naval treaties of the 1930s. Starting at eight inches, 203 millimeters, as you see here with Furutaka, as we saw with Pensacola on up in the American line, you are considered a heavy cruiser. For a long time in World of Warships, the distinction between those two was semantic, really, right? Um, but about four years ago, I think it's about four years now, Wargaming finally uh, came in and made some uh, notable distinctions between heavy and light cruisers, how the game treated them, most critically in terms of how their armor schemes tended to be balanced out. And we'll talk about that. We've talked about that in the German heavy cruiser line. We talked about it in the Americans, and we're going to talk about it here as well. For Furutaka's case, though, it means that she is a heavy cruiser in a tier where basically every other cruiser in her tier, not her matchmaking bracket, but in her tier, isn't, right? There are only two other proper heavy cruisers at tier eight. They're both premiums. That's that's uh, British uh, British premium HMS Exeter, which, by the way, is one of the most, one of the best tier five premiums you can get. If you don't own an Exeter, I highly recommend it. Um, and the other one is uh, Italian premium, Genova, which is a ship that I despise and yet somehow seem to be able to turn out decent games in on occasion when I take the thing out, usually when my, my Twitch chat trolls me and makes me play it. So Furutaka is completely unlike any other cruiser you're going to run into at Tier 5, right? If I put this thing next to an Omaha, we wouldn't even be talking, we wouldn't even be talking in the same planet, right? They're just, they just don't play alike. So Let's talk about Furutaka. Let's talk about how she fits in. Let's talk about what makes the Japanese heavy cruisers, gives them their little flavor, and uh, and we'll go from there. All right? So let's uh, let's get to it. Like we do, we always start talk, talk, talk talking about a ship's survivability. Furutaka's health pool, 30,700 HP. That is unbuffed. I'm not running survivability expert here on the captain. So that is so what you see is what you get. And, of course, 4% torpedo protection. The torpedo protection is, I mean, it's tied for worst in tier. I mean, other than zero, there's plenty of cruisers in this tier that have zero torpedo protection. You have 4%, which might as well be zero for all the all the value it's going to do you. Don't take torpedoes. Just, 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 just don't. It's not good. This is bad. It's super bad. You don't want to take this. Now, the health pool, on the other hand, is noteworthy. Um, it is not, it is not amazing but it is on the high end in the sense of 
the runaway uh, runaway guy in this tier is uh, oh, I'll say runaway, but the leader in this tier is uh, is Hawkins over in the British tech tree, and Hawkins wants to think it's a light a heavy cruiser, and I guess maybe technically by the treaties of the era it is. It's like seven and a half inch guns, but to me the break point has always been has always been two hundred and three. So I'm gonna hold I'm gonna hold on to my little my little farce that Furutaka remains the only one. I technically you would have to play a Hawkins like a heavy cruiser, even though those guns are a little a little smaller. But Hawkins has about 32,000 HP, so she's got about 1,500 more HP than you. But basically, every other cruiser in Tier 5 has less health than this. Um, Exeter, we talked about British Premium Exeter. Exeter has more effective health than this because she gets a heal. Um, so she has about eight or 900 hit points less than you, but she gets a heal, and that makes a big difference. So keep that in mind if you run into an Exeter. Right? If you're fighting one, he's going to be able to hang in the fight longer than you, but this is a solid health pool, right? This is a very, very solid health pool. Now, it's not going to stand up to battleships, is it, right? It's not meant to. You know, a battleship that focuses you relentlessly for a while, if you're not paying attention or if he gets lucky with dispersion, you're, you'll melt. But this is a very, very solid health pool, very competitive, uh, lots to like. Armor layout. Bow armor is only 13 millimeters. This is terrible. If you recall, when we were talking about the American heavy cruiser lines and the German heavy cruiser lines with heavy cruisers, we talked about the ability to quote unquote bow tank as a heavy cruiser. Generally, certain battleships that mount smaller caliber guns, usually in the 12 to 14 inch range, certain heavy cruisers cannot be overmatched through the bow with guns of that caliber. Furutaka here with this pathetically armored bow does not suffer this problem whatsoever. Every battleship she runs into should be able to overmatch this bow pretty effectively. So it does mean that, that Furutaka will feel a little more fragile than perhaps her American counterparts. She makes up for it a little bit, however, in the belt armor. I gotta turn that on the torpedo protection off, right? She's got 76 millimeters of belt armor, and that's not bad. Her deck armor, though, 48 millimeters. This is nice. This is something that I think a lot of players underestimate because, again, the majority of the cruisers you're going to run into, and even if, even if you were do run into some of the aforementioned heavy cruisers, those shells, those, those little, let's say, 203 millimeter shells and below, they will be able to pin 32 millimeters of armor. If they drop those shells onto your deck, and gun ballistics in the middle tiers tend to be a little floaty, right? A lot more shells coming down than going at, you know, uh, sideways, right? Laser, laser, the Ru no, my Russian laser guns in the middle tiers. Um, they, they'll shatter on this deck. Now, they'll still be able to start fires, but the deck will shatter them. If they can catch you in the casemate armor, you see here 25 millimeters, that will be a full pen, of course. But if the shell is plunging in from above, you have, you're decently protected. Like, this is actually a little surprising. And I think it's one of the things that makes Furutaka a little more resilient than she might otherwise be given credit for. Have a quick look at the Citadel. Turn off the barbettes. And the Citadel is appropriately large, right? You would expect this of a giant, of a, of a, of a large cruiser. And for a ship that is this narrow, right? Furutaka doesn't have a lot of beam. She's not that wide. She makes up for it by being very, very long. She's very long and skinny. So the Citadel is proportionally long, basically from the superstructure all the way back to the aftermast, as is well above the waterline. And again, only three inches of armor on this plate. Heavy cruisers will pen will full, will pen this in Citadel. You battleships will absolutely slap you silly. You'll get deleted, right? If you get caught in a turn, you'll get deleted. As we saw with some of the mid-tier American heavies, the, the forward magazine and the after magazine are a little buried in the ship. So the odds of you taking citadels up there, pretty small. But I wouldn't worry about this. I'd worry about this. This is a giant shoot-me sign. And every battleship and uh, have, light cruisers can citadel you, right? Like you run into, um, you know, a Dallas or something, uh, you know, tier six Dallas. He can, he can load the AP and citadel this. Like three inches of plate, his AP will pen that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, You've got to be very focused about keeping an angle uh, or keeping bow on. And the bow on gets you most of your firepower, but not all of it. So you definitely want to uh, you definitely keep that in mind. But yeah, the armor the armor is has some surprising qualities. I think that deck armor is what, what shocked me the most when I really stopped to look at it. But overall, you know, you're pretty fragile, right? You're, you're meant to be, and, and you are. They, they definitely got that right. Maneuverability and concealment. 36 knots is uh, with the speed flag. Let's look at her base speed. Survey says... 35, basically, a little under 35. That's pretty solid for this tier. It's not best in tier. The Russians have got a couple of ships faster. 
Um, uh, the Italians have won uh, the Italian Tier 5. Uh, Raimondo Montecuccoli is a faster uh, faster ship at light cruiser. And even Yahagi, uh, a Tier 5 Japanese premium, a smidge faster than this. But you've got plenty of speed, right? you got plenty of speed for what you need to be doing to get in and out, of, to jet in and out of your gun range. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, to certainly to run down most opposing destroyers. So yeah, good speed. 750 on the turning circle is an acknowledgement to her, her her overall length. This is not quite worse in tier. The Soviets have a couple ships that are worse than this, but it's definitely on the high end. It's it's very close to worst in tier. So the ship has a large turning circle. She's very responsive on the rudder, though. 5.7 seconds there is is um, a little buffed, but I mean, it's 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 nice, right? The rudder shift is good. She's responsive, but the turning circle is large. So you just gotta, you know, gotta play accordingly. Now, concealment. 10.7 on the surface. That is really, 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 really nice. Now, Furutaka Stealth is not best in tier, but it is still quite solid, right? Your 10.7 detection on a cruiser in the middle tiers. That puts you ahead of, well, it puts you ahead of basically all the Soviets. Katovsky accepted, but, you know, all of their, all of their bigger stuff, certainly. Puts you ahead of the Americans. Puts you ahead of the Germans. Um, puts you ahead of the French. You're basically tied with the British, more or less. Although, actually, no, all the Brits outspot you. Um, you're a little behind the Italians. You're way behind the Pan Asians, um, and you're and you're a little behind some of your other contemporaries, right? Like, there's now a tier five Japanese light cruiser. That's a Gano that has a little better detection than this. So, it's not you know the detection is a bonus when you're fighting battleships in the sense of. If all you're doing is picking on an opposing battleship that's charging you, or he's all you've really got to shoot at, or you're all he can see, you control that engagement. But against opposing cruisers, I'd say probably roughly half the time, and this is actually uh, this is actually good for you because uh, as most, of these, most of these other nations get heavy cruisers up at tier six and tier seven in your matchmaking bracket, they're more detectable than you. So I'd still say probably approximately about half the opposing cruisers that you'll run into will outspot you, and the other half you'll have a spotting advantage on. And you're going to have to kind of kind of learn to gauge that as you go and how to take advantage of that. 5.2 aerial detection is pretty typical. That's going to match your AA radius, and, uh, well, that, that is what it is, more or less. So, so yeah, um, that's uh, that's basically that. So she's fairly stealthy, but not quite best in tier. It is an asset, but you got to kind of, you got to have to, you, you can really maximize it in certain situations and not so much in others. Let's talk about her main battery. Now, before we get into this, um, I want to go back and look at her equipment setup. Furutaka has, is one of those rare cruisers that has a gun module upgrade. And we saw this on Rune, the video I did for Tier 9 uh, German cruiser Rune in the tech tree. She also has a gun upgrade. Like Rune, I'm going to recommend when you're grinding this ship out, or if you want to spend the free XP, this should be the first thing you buy. This needs to be the first thing you buy. The gun reload you see there on this original module, when you buy this thing stock straight out of the port, 22 seconds. For a heavy cruiser, that's lunacy. It's terrible. It's worse than Genova, and I consider Genova to be car to be garbage. So, I mean, don't do that. <laughs> Just don't, don't do that to yourself. Spend the free XP, pick up the gun upgrade first, then focus on the other stuff, the hull and, and whatnot, okay? Once you have the gun upgrade, you are looking at what will become a fairly common gun for you as you move up the line. This is a Japanese 203 50 caliber gun. On a reload here, here at tier five, we have a 15 second reload, which is slow. I mean, again, most, all, most, all the cruisers you're going to run into will have a significant reload advantage over you. The difference is, is that your shells hit way harder. And we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, 26.1 on the turret traverse. That is a little bit of a buff. I'm sure the stock turret traverse is about 30 seconds or so. Yeah, 30 seconds. So uh, that's something worth taking the one point skill to kind of help a little bit because you will be maneuvering quite a bit. Um, you're definitely going to want the help. Maximum dispersion. You see there it's 111. That's with a buff. I am running the dispersion reduction uh, uh, module in, uh, in slot, uh, I think it's slot three. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit. <sighs> We have to we have to point this out when we talk about the main battery. All right, one of the one of the the perks that the Japanese cruisers get over many other heavy cruisers is slightly improved accuracy. Now I have to caveat this. Okay, the every cruiser in the game, most just about every cruiser in the game has a 2.0 sigma value. If you're unfamiliar with what that means. Um, I'll put a link in the video description. You can go do a little reading. The short version is 
that sig- the, the higher the sigma number, it represents how consistent your shells are, you should, how consistently your shells will land towards the, mid, the center of your dispersion ellipse. Ships with a lower sigma are less accurate. Ships with a higher sigma are more accurate. And I believe, I believe 2.1 or 2.2 is about the highest value in the game. Cruiser sigma is basically 2.0 across the board. There are a handful of exceptions. I think Stalingrad, for example, is like 2.05 or something. But they're, they're basically all around the 2.0. The Japanese heavy cruisers get slightly smaller dispersion ellipses than most of their counterparts. And then you can further improve that, of course, with a module upgrade. That's what you're seeing here. It does not mean that every salvo you fire is laser pinpoint accurate, but it does mean that over the course of a battle, provided you don't get deleted quickly, right, your guns will put more shells where you aim them than most other most of your contemporaries. It is noteworthy. It is a really nice perk that the Japanese heavy cruisers get, and it's one of the reasons that I really like recommending this line for people who have kind of developed their aiming skill or want to continue to develop their aiming skill because it really rewards exceptionally good aim. If you know where to aim, if you've got a good idea of how to lead a target in terms of, of distance and angle or you know whatever, you, these ships will absolutely reward you. This is not a battleship. These shells will go where you point them the majority of the time. I'd say 65, 70% of the time. You're always going to have outlier shells that do weird things. But sometimes you'll have these perfect salvos where like all six shells cluster together and you have a massive like four or five citadel salvo on somebody. It can happen. Um, and it's beautiful when it does. And it's it's a nice perk of, of the Japanese heavy cruisers. Maximum range there, 13.9 kilometers is pretty awesome. Awful. It's not worst in tier, but most of the ships that are below it are are light cruisers, and there are quite a few light cruisers in this tier in this match that have more range than this. This is another handicap you're going to have to play through. You got to deal with as you play through the line. Basically, every Japanese cruiser's main battery, uh, Japanese heavy cruiser's main battery range is gimped in some fashion. Um, the good news is, as we talked about a moment ago, you've got a little bit of extra stealth bonus to help compensate for it. The bad news is, is that it does sometimes limit your targets because I don't believe there's any Japanese cruisers that can take spotter planes. Maybe. Maybe there is and I'm forgetting. I know at the top of the line, you can take the range module in slot six, and there's an opportunity cost to that we'll discuss when we get to Ibuki and Zhao. But the bottom line is, is that here in the middle tiers, you're stuck with having a little bit less range than everybody else, and you just got to adapt. HE shells. 3,300 base damage, 4,700 base on the AP. These are really good. This is basically best in tier for HE. The Brits, the British HE shells are really good, but they're not this good um, in terms of HE damage. And the AP is amazing. I think the only people who come close to this is the Italians. Yeah, Genova's shells are about like this. McCoyan's shells are not far behind this in terms of AP. Uh, neither are, uh, neither is, so is um, uh, Exeter right behind this at 4550. So you basically have best in tier shells, HE and AP. When these shells land, you are going to hit things hard. You will notice, you will notice. You'll see some salvos in my sample game coming up that you're like, whoa, okay, that hurt. Exactly. Imagine being on the receiving end of that. So these shells coupled with this accuracy is a really nice perk and a really huge benefit of these ships. The other thing I want to point out, we've talked about this with heavy cruisers before. You see there on the main battery, 34 millimeters of penetration out of the HE. That means that most many, let's not say most, many of the battleships that you're going to encounter in your matchmaking bracket, certainly starting here at tier five, certainly at tier six, have 32 millimeters of uh, of armor, either through the casemate or the superstructure, you will do tremendously good work picking on such targets. I'm looking at you, American battleships, French battleships, British battleships, okay? These kinds of ships will will just hoover up your a, your HE shells. They'll so, you'll, you'll soak tons of damage into them. You'll light fires. You'll just, the damage totals you can rack out of a Japanese Japanese heavy cruiser will shock you. Um, this is some, this is one of the easier shit, one of the easier lines in the game to farm like witherer achievements with because the fire chance coupled with those HE shells is just brutally punishing. So yes, excellent main battery. Um, 
So we talked a lot about the shells. Let's have a quick look. You've got a super firing pair up forward and a single turret back aft. This is the stock configuration of the ship. All that changes when you get the gun upgrade is uh, the barrels themselves change from the old 200 millimeter gun to this 203 millimeter gun. Now, if you're playing Furutaka, you know, today in the modern era of World of Warships, be thankful because her historical gun configuration did not look like this. And when the game launched, the historical gun configuration was what you got. And it was incredibly unpleasant to play. There are probably still some people in the game that think of old Furutaka as being terrible. And old Furutaka was terrible. But about two and a half years into the game or so, somewhere along there, I'd have to go back and pull patch notes, but like, it's been more than four or five years now, I feel like. Um, Wargaming, uh, not only did they add what was originally at the time the sea hull Furutaka that gave us this gun layout, they eventually did away with the old single turret arrangement. In fact, I don't think you can even get that now, can you? Uh, doesn't look like it. I'm actually curious now. Let's have a peek. Let's let's just make sure. Let's make sure I'm not lying. No, okay, the A-hole Furutaka. Yeah, so, so literally now you just get A-hole, B-hole Furutaka. Gun layout remains the same. That's something you'll never have to fight against. As uh, Be glad, just be glad. Furutaka is much nicer to play now than she used to be. We have to talk about torpedoes. Okay, the Japanese heavy cruisers have appropriately amazing Japanese torpedoes, right? These are 610 millimeter torpedoes. They hit like trains for the tier. They have a 10 kilometer range. They are wonderful. You will get lots of good work out of these torpedoes all up and down the line. One of the things that we have to talk about, though, is torpedo firing angles. This is one of the things you're going to consistently kind of fight against and struggle a bit with as you play these ships. Most of the most of the Japanese heavy cruisers do not have favorable torpedo angles for firing the torpedoes in a forward arc. In the sense of, if I'm in a close range engagement with a battleship and a German cruiser, I can kind of sail up alongside him 15, 20 degrees, dump torpedoes over the side of the ship, and laugh at him as he explodes and I sail away. In a Japanese cruiser, most of them... The torpedo angles start way back here, well aft of the, like, like at 100 degrees. They run from like 100 to 140 degrees or 150 degrees. They're very stern focused. And that means in order for me to torpedo somebody at close range, I have to show them the entire flat broadside of my ship and then some before I can even get my torpedoes into the water. Furutaka, blessedly, is not a ship that suffers from this. I'll put the, uh, the little graphic up here that shows you her forward torpedo angles, but the short version is she has a, she has a significantly more improved forward angles than, uh, than some of her contemporaries. Excuse me, not contemporaries, um, uh, 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 successors. Um, but you see there, uh, the torpedo angles start about 46 degrees off the bow and run to about... Uh, about a hundred and thirty, little past one hundred and thirty-five degrees. Uh, so you've got a pretty, you've got about a ninety-degree cone, more or less, close to it, off the side of the ship. Basically, basically about forty-five degrees to about forty-five degrees, you can fire the torpedoes. So Furutaka's torpedo angles are a little less focused on the on uh, stern, you know, firing back over the stern. You can actually use her torpedoes in a close-range engagement without giving up the entire ship. Um, you will not have this problem when you get to Alba and Miyoko and Mogami. So don't get used to it, okay? Enjoy it while you have it, and it is one of the nice perks of the ship. But these torpedoes hit like trains, like most things in this tier cannot handle these. And you see there, I've, those are on an 85-second reload. I think I've got the torpedo reload skill. Yeah. So just like the Japanese light cruisers, in my opinion, this little two-point skill is, not, is, is occasionally worth investing in. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute when we get over to captain skills. But the torpedoes are excellent. You need to be firing them. Every opportunity that you think you might possibly land something, they're great for area denial. They're great for vomiting out there, and you'll just you just never know who's going to wander into one. And uh, they're a lot of fun. <laughs> you can you'll see you'll get some crazy shenanigans out of these torpedoes. Airstrikes. I mean, yay! Welcome to tier five. You're going to start seeing tier six submarines. You're going to need this. Um, the good news is is that the bad news is you only get one strike with one bomb in it. The good news is that bomb hurts, right? The Japanese depth charges, both the ones aerially and uh, aerially dropped and the ones that they drop off their destroyers have really, really good damage values. You see there, 3,400 damage. That will absolutely 
that enemy submarine's going to know he's been touched when you hit him with that. Unfortunately, because we don't have access to upgrade slot six, I don't believe we can take the uh, the airstrike modification that would allow us to lower the time of this any better. All we can do to bring that from 30 seconds down to 27 here is to take the focus fire training skill, which I've done for the moment on this captain, which is why you see the 27 second reload. AA defense. Um, yeah, this is terrible. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, I sang the praises of this all throughout the American heavy cruisers. The Japanese heavies are basically on the opposite end of that conversation. They are downright terrible at anti-aircraft fire. It's towards the top of the line. They get like passable, but basically the five, six, seven, and eight, it's just, it's just, it's terrible. You're not worse than tier, but you're like in the bottom three. So imagine all the tier five cruisers in the game. You have like the third worst or the second worst AA of all of them. Now, you do have a long-range bubble. That's nice. There are some cruisers in this tier that don't have a long-range bubble at all. The bad news is that long-range bubble is very light. It only does, you know, you see there, 39, 40 damage, and you only put up two flak puffs. So when you get plane kills in, when you get plane kills in this ship, congr you know, pat yourself on the back. You'll get a few every now and then. Um, more commonly, this AA will just annoy the enemy carrier, um, but it's not really going to do significant amounts of damage. So uh, I would not lean into it at all. I do still take the little two-point skill. I still think this is worth it for only two points, especially since it's the one way I can get my airstrikes to recharge a little faster, and I will run into submarines. But I mean, I would not take defensive fire on the ship, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, so yeah, don't, uh, don't count on getting much out of the AA. It's not great. All right, so let's talk about um, kind of the upgrades, flags, captain skills, how you fit this ship out. Uh, oh, you can't take defensive fire. Never mind. So consumables-wise, this is real easy. You're stuck, with, you're stuck with this. You don't get a choice. You get damage control, you get hydroacoustic search, and you get fighters. You will occasionally get use out of the fighters, but again, when you get a plane kill off a fighter, pat yourself on the back and go buy a lottery ticket. That's, that's how well they work these days. Um, modules. In my opinion, you should always be taking main armaments modification one in slot one. Um, the damage control party on Japanese ships is kind of a valid option. Your DCP only lasts for five seconds. This gives you a 40% bonus. This would take it all the way out to seven seconds. But is it really worth it for that? I don't think so. I'd rather take main armaments modification one. Um, if you don't have Juliet Charlie's, you're worried about blowing up. Magazine mod one is a perfectly valid choice. I would not take auxiliary. You don't, you don't need this. Um... The second slot presents you with a couple of uh, good, uh, good options. I mean, you're a heavy cruiser. You will occasionally catch on fire. So DCMS is not terrible. This, this just makes it a little less likely that you'll, that you'll catch on fire. Um, engine room protection, also not a bad choice. Uh, HE shells that miss you completely. Battleship HE, for example, that splashes in the water will knock out your engine. So this is not bad. Uh, conversely, if you don't want to invest here, you could look at the one-point commander skill last stand. We'll talk about that in a sec. The hydro one is honestly my recommendation. I'm not sure why I don't have it here on my Furutaka, but if you got the coal and you can afford this, this is the way to go. Um, you will get a lot of use out of this. We've seen the torpedo protection is bad. This is, this is a good, this is a really good pick. And then in slot three, in my mind, you're crazy to take anything other than aiming systems modification, right? You already get that little bonus because you're Japanese to the dispersion, but this just makes it better. Just makes it better. And it is better. It's so good. Um, if you don't, if you're not going this way, I think main battery mod is okay. Not bad. I would not take secondary battery. I would not take AA guns modification. We just got through talking about how bad the AA is. Don't invest significantly in it. Um, and the torpedo tubes mod, again, you could make a case here, but I don't think it's worth it. To me, your choices are either aiming mod or main battery mod. And I strongly encourage you to take aiming systems modification one. Commander skills. My default for a, a Japanese heavy cruiser is basically mostly going to be... Um, uh, grease the gears, gun feeder, uh, likely demolition expert or priority target. You can kind of pick one there. Uh, Adrenaline rush at tier three and um, concealment expert down here at tier four. I Again, I like having focus fire here at tier two. I think this is a, an excellent choice for two points. Even if I never see a plane, um, I'm getting a little bit extra on reload on my uh, airstrike. So I'm a big fan of that. And then... There's value in this torpedo skill, right? You want to be putting these torpedoes downrange every opportunity you get. I think this is a great skill. Other skills you could consider. Um, I wouldn't do that. Uh, the consumables enhancement skill wouldn't be bad. A little bit of extra hydro duration. For two points, maybe not amazing, but okay. Um, I would not invest in, uh, in this at all. The A and ASW is probably not really worth it. I don't think I would invest in superintendent. Um, there's a case to be made for the heavy AP. 
you're not going to be firing it as reliably as you are on an American heavy cruiser, but you'll be firing it enough, you'll get some use out of it. Survivability expert, not bad, actually. This sounds like a terrible skill for a ship that has got a citadel this large. You'll be surprised how, how often you're able, to, you're able to cling to life with just a little bit of HP. So if you want to sink three points into this, not bad. Um, I like Last Stand. I don't have it on this captain, but I think it's not a bad choice. You'll see in the sample game in a little while, I think I get a, I have a shell that comes in, knocks out my, I remember it now, it does, it does knock out my, um, my engine and my rudder. Uh, this might have helped against that, or will really at least let me continue to use them, and I wouldn't have had to burn my DCP on it. So I think that's a good call. Some people like incoming fire alert. Give that a go if you like. You don't need IFHE. Don't spend points here. Um, I don't think radio location is a good call. Destroyer hunting is not really your strong suit. Outnumbered, I mean, nah. Top grade gunner, hmm, possibly. Um, again, for a heavy cruiser, if they're inside of 14 kilometers, you're getting a little bit of a bonus to your main battery. There's some value here, but I think you're, I think you're better off kind of leaning into some of these skills in the in the in the second and third tier, and not spending too much time in the fourth tier of outside of concealment expert. All right, we had a walk around the ship. Let's go look at some gameplay, and then we'll be back here in a minute for a little bit of outro. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the south spawn of Two Brothers, everyone's favorite map in random battles. We're having a look here, of course, at Tier 5 Japanese Heavy Cruiser Furutaka, and have you a quick look at the matchmaking there in the top right and the top left? Well, we're bottom tier. Now, being a bottom tier light cruiser in World of Warships is, in my experience, very different from being a bottom tier heavy cruiser. Heavy cruisers are built for the late game, really, and as long as I play relatively smart, don't make dumb mistakes early, and kind of jealously protect my health, I ought to be able to last in this game, despite being, you know, bottom tier. I have to obviously stay frosty for uh, the three opposing battleships. Luckily for me, all of the opposing cruisers are light cruisers, although those Helenas mount enough guns that that can be a real problem for me if I'm not careful. I'm never excited to see two submarines in a game. And the opposing ranger, something I'm, you're not going to hear me say very often, is actually a bit of a threat to me, simply because as a Japanese heavy cruiser, my anti-aircraft firepower is pretty subpar, as we talked about earlier. My initial deployment here, I'm spawning way, way over on the right-hand side of the map here, in the extreme uh, extreme bottom, bottom right corner. I'm going to try and move up on the cap, use this island for a little bit of cover, see if this Nicholas wants to play, and I'm going to kind of back back him up, as well as working up here with the uh, U-69. I catch a glimpse of this Helena. I think this U-69's got him lit on the surface, so I use my expert gunner skills, swap to the AP, and try for a salvo. Most of his salvo lands short, take a little bit of chip damage there, and I'm able to get a few shells back. Unfortunately, obviously none of the big citadels I'm looking for, just a handful of opens. Feels kind of bad. One of the opposing submarines, the Cachalot, way over on the map edge, and there's a Farragut here as well. Hmm. Good hit on the submarine. And now, now we get to engage this Farragut. All right, so let's talk real briefly, all right? I'm, I sort of mentioned it in the, in the you know, talking about the, the main battery of the Japanese heavy cruisers. You're really going to see it in action here in this engagement. The accuracy of these guns cannot be overstated. I'm putting six shells downrange every 15 seconds. Watch how many hits I get on this, this maneuvering Farragut and watch what those eight, those big old HE shells do to him. It is absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. He cuts back to starboard for him. Five out of the six for 4,600 hit points. 4,600 hit points on a ship that only has 11,000. That was nearly half of his health. Another, look at the groupings. Like, look at that. Those six shells almost all go in the same place. Again, I landed five of them, but we're starting to see a little bit of saturation. I do get a stern fire there, but before my guns can reload, he's actually going to blunder into one of my torpedoes for a first blood. I'll pause again real briefly. The torpedoes are a key feature of these ships. We talked about it again, you know, earlier talking about the, the ship in port. It cannot be overstated. Every opportunity you have to vomit torpedoes out at something that you think might wander into them, you need to be doing it. A lot of players either forget or underestimate the Japanese torpedoes, certainly off the heavy cruisers, 
And uh, you can score some pretty surprising hits, especially when you, people are pushing into you and you're kiting. Nicholas has got balls of steel. You see him over there on the edge of the cap as the opposing Minikaze works the edge. So for the moment, decap going nowhere. Helen is still lurking behind the Islander up in there, that smoke, and we have kind of lost the cash a lot there along the 10 line. So not a lot to shoot at right now. I'm putting HE back in the barrel. I figure, why not? I just beat up one destroyer. Let's beat up another. We're going to lose him, though. I'm not quite sure how he was spotted. I think the U69 might have had him lit on the surface, and then the 69 had to dive to avoid getting shot. And so we miss, we lose him for just a bit, but then U69 picks him back up. I had AP in the barrel there because I was thinking I was going to have a shot on this Helena, so I just went ahead and fired it rather than wait. Wait for another salvo. Didn't get much out of it. Kind of not surprising. But now more than one of us are chipping in on this Minikaze. He's lit. The Nicholas and the Colorado both shooting at him. I'm going to get a pretty solid salvo here. Memory serves. There we go. Three of the six. A lot less hull to shoot at here. All right, Minikaze is a smaller target than that Farragut was. His engine is out. I'm going to have to pull that next salvo short. But the U69 takes care of it. And so now... They're down two destroyers on this flank, and you can see I was going to take a shot at the Helena, but this is where Furutaka's kind of, yeah, but let's be honest, her bad range, right, comes into play here. That guy's at the bat, the extreme edge of my range and reversing. I basically have no shot. Um, if I want to get my guns back to action, I'm going to have to move back up, uh, back forward of where I am now. The good news is, though, is I've still got some ships out here doing a little bit of spotting and screening for me. My surface detection, we talked about it, you know, talking about the ship remains an asset. Ten, a little over ten and a half. The cash lot, of course, will outspot me. I think even the Helen, the Helen and I are pretty close. I don't remember Helena's surface detection off the top of my head, but I know that with the U69 it there, I ought to have at least a little bit of warning. Now the Colorado on my port side here is kind of outnumbered. He's got two different Helenas, an Iron Duke and an opposing Colorado basically all shooting at him, and even the Ranger is harassing him. I'm able to chip in what little bit I can get out of my AA here as the, the bombs kind of pass down my port side, but Furutaka's AA is really not worth getting excited about. You'll kill a few planes here and there, but these are not the American heavies, so set your expectations accordingly. Iron Duke shows me a shot, but I blow it. I overlead him grossly. We catch a brief glimpse of the Cachalot, and then now we've got, we can see the Helena still back behind that island. Again, the Iron Duke now at the extreme edge of my range. That's going to be a really garbage shot. So I'm going to put my lock, my target lock back on the Helena and see if I can pick him up as he comes around the edge of the island. Loading the AP. I should have a really good shot here. Let's see if we can maximize it. We know he's kind of coming over there. The U-69 is lit on the surface uh, by the rocket planes. I assume he's going to dive here in a moment. Come on, I know that Helen is there. I'm just, I'm just sitting here waiting. He was moving around that corner, and right there. There he is. Kind of just barely inching forward. I'm definitely going to take some of this salvo. Whoever let it just a bit. I don't get a good hit there, unfortunately. Oh, he turned into it. I see now. Yep. Carrier's going to come in for a rocket strike for a little bit of chip damage. The rockets are the least of my concerns off the Ranger. Hell in a loaded AP, got a good Citadel there. I'm going to keep the AP in the barrel for now. That restricts what he can, the ang kinds of angles he can show me. But again, remember me talk, telling you about fire the torpedoes every chance you get? This is why. This is why. He turns into two of them with his Hydro either offline or down. I don't know which. He takes two. That's a significant chunk of his HP. Problem solved, sir. Now I'm going to have just the stern tubes available. The AP is what I had, but we'll swap to the HE. It will not take much to finish this guy off. In fact, between myself and the Nicholas, if I can get enough HE shells on target, we can probably finish this guy before my bow guns finish turning around. Let's see if we can pull it off. Enemy cruiser sunk. When you're a bottom tier cruiser, it always feels good to kill a top tier cruiser because that guy should have just murdered you. Now, it's unfortunate that the U-69 was moving up the line there. He is now out. So now it's just me and the Nicholas and the Ranger on this side of the map. Take a quick, take a quick peek at the mini map in the bottom right hand corner. It's we're now in a five on three. Then the Nicholas is going to be harassed by planes just mercilessly. You see there him getting dive bombed. So before too much longer, it's going to be just me and this Ranger. 
Now, the New Orleans, uh, back along the sea cap, you see him there in about G4 or whatever. He's sort of coming back this way. And we have two battleships that have pushed up the, the, uh, the channel there, a Doria and an Agincourt. That's going to cause the opposing team to have to make some uncomfortable choices about where they're going to maneuver next. Me, I've still got a little bit of smoke up here. The Nicholas smoke shrouding, uh, shrouding that particular shot. I took it with a hell of it was at the extreme edge of my range, and I thought, you know, let's try it. And sure enough, those shells all fell about 15 meters shy of where I want. I had the lead, right? Right? Those would have, those might have been citadels had I had just a little more range on the guns. You're going to constantly fight the range uh, of these ships, especially in Furutaka, right? It's just under 14 kilometers. It will frequently frustrate you. Luckily, your detection radius uh, allows you to play some shenanigans, but uh, you're always going to be fighting the range of these guns. It's just something you're going to have to get used to uh, in the, in the, when you play these ships. It's just the way it is. Helena's turning back. Iron Duke is in the cap. We know the Cachalot probably still somewhere out in front of me, clearly submerged. Colorado turning around, and even the Ranger up there is sort of maneuvering back. Now, I'll be curious to see if the Ranger makes it. He's got two battleships in front of him, who, can, who should clearly be able to see him on the surface. So it will really surprise me. Oh, oh, you hate to see it, don't you? Well, there goes the opposing carrier. So we've got about a two-ship lead here. Both teams finally sitting on two caps. As uh, I'm going to do something probably a little ill-advised, I'm going to pick a fight with a moderately healthy Helena. Now, my strategy here... Let's, let's, let's talk about this engagement real fast. For starters, I'm getting some help, right? You see there, someone else is, uh, is, is, is hitting him as well. In this engagement, a good Helena player is not going to show me an angle for AP. I'm going to have to rely on the HE and my accuracy to drop these shells on his deck and, and hopefully get some fires. I've already see, you see I've already got one fire burning on his stern. He doesn't have a heal, so every point of damage I land is going to stick. He's continuing to maneuver in the cap there. We got three out of that salvo. That feels pretty good. If I get two to three shells of salvo on him, I ought to be able to get about three-ish, three to four thousand points a pop. I lead that one thinking he's going to swing back to starboard. He doesn't. He holds that line. So that salvo, unfortunately, uh, doesn't, doesn't land until uh, right before he starts his turn. But now the New Orleans that has come back, you see him there, the back there in about, what is that, about h6 or so he's been chipping in he's been helping he got one of those fires and i land just enough shells to pick him up that feels good i killed i killed what oh all right so let's let's talk about let's talk about this a minute we've talked before we talked during the american heavy cruiser line videos we talked about it at, you know earlier in this video this this sort of engagement right here is why why I feel like Hydro, especially in the middle tiers, has become a very, very, very big, uh, big pick. The, the superior pick for the majority of cruisers in World of Warships. Now, it's the other reason you'll see me start taking the Airstrike mod on some of my cruiser builds. My Hydro is going to run out before I kill this guy, right? Uh, Ten seconds here, more or less. So I'm going to get off one more strike. My goal is to try to lead this correctly and get a direct hit. If I can get a direct hit, I ju we just saw it. He took a fire and a flood. We know he DCP'd. He's going to sail right into this bomb. That's going to do a ton of damage. Right there, about 3k. You see to the top right, ticking up. We know he's flooding. And he can't put that flood out for a while. So, right now, with the, the oil slick, I'm just going to track him. I'm going to troll here at half speed. I know he's basically right under my keel somewhere. I'm guessing... I kind of guessed wrong with that one. I should have waited for that, that oil cloud to come up. That bomb is actually a little astern of of where he probably is now. Still counts as a direct hit as he's trying to surface. And my secondaries... My secondaries pick up a kill on the opposing submarine. Those guys get an extra sake ration, let me tell you. <laughs> Anytime you get a kill out of cruiser secondaries, just giggle because you won't see that often. It's hilarious. All right, so let's let's pause again and take stock of the game. We're having a good game, four kills, right? But I'm way over on the 10 line. The good news is that between my... The, see, the Iron Duke is literally exploding right in front of me. The Nick, He and the Nicholas have traded. That clears the decap, right? The decap is now completely open. Um, 
all I have to worry about is this Colorado, and I can see that guy coming. So as long as I don't do something stupid like sail around um, and fire my guns, I can get up here and cap D. The opposing carrier is dead. They only have the opposing U-69 who outspots me, and he's way over. You can look at the mini-map way over last spotted over on the two-line. So I'm basically going to get a free cap. Next few minutes are going to be pretty boring. I'm not going to lie. Um, but you can kind of see what, you know, like, Furutaka. Oh, I love this boat, man. I love this boat. There was a time this ship was just not very good. And there are people in the game that I think maybe haven't revisited her in the years since. Um, you know, when the game first released, what, we're coming up a little seven, eight years now, uh, the, the certainly the A-hole Furutaka, the original single-barreled six-turret configuration, was terrible. The, tur or the traverse on those turrets was like, like, it was worse than battleships. It was awful. And you had a lot of guns. They hit decently hard. The shell ballistics were terrible. There was just a, there was a whole lot to hate about that ship. About two-ish years into the game, two and a half, maybe three, something along those lines, Wargaming introduced, of course, this hull of Furutaka, and uh, they gave us what was then, at the time, the sea hull of Furutaka, with, which this, with this gun layout, and which is the same gun layout you're going to get on Alba at Tier 6, so... You know, spend some time kind of familiarizing yourself with it, and it is very, very, very strong. Very strong. When you marry this turret arrangement to the amazing Japanese dispersion, uh, you can get at a, a tremendous amount of good work out of these guns. So we're under the cap now with the, um, with the New Orleans. This Colorado is right at the edge of my range. I could be putting shells into him right now. He's, that, he's slow enough that I could be lighting him up. But I, right now I'm doing two things. One, I'm capping. And two, I'm pretty sure that I'm spotting for this New Orleans off my uh, my port quarter here because I don't believe that that New Orleans, uh, the uh, Colorado, can see him. So I'm getting some uh, some some spotting damage or something. Yeah, there you go. You can see it ticking up. I'm getting a little bit of spotting damage there. I want to cap first. First and foremost, I want to finish this cap before I give this Colorado something to shoot at. I'm I'm kind of playing a little destroyer here, and there are times in low health. Low health is the wrong word. Low detection. Low detection cruisers, such as these Japanese heavies, such as sometimes the um, the British lights, that you are the destroyer in a game, right? Other than the opposing U-69, I'm now the stealthiest thing on the board, believe it or not. Um, even the New Orleans is a little less stealthy than I am. Now, the plan there, let's, let's talk about that salvo, right? Ordinarily, I would be an idiot to pick a fight with an opposing Colorado. But I was just about to cut behind the island, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get these shells down range and get some resets right as I cut behind the island and cut line of sight. What I hadn't counted on was the schoolers having a line of sight on me for a little while longer. Now I'm trying to get shells and resets on him, but he's going to go right behind the island. I think I'm going to get maybe a couple of these shells over. No, I'm going to get them all over, but he's a little too quick. So I'm going to get a reset off of a ricochet. I don't get any damage, but I do get the reset. I did get a fire on the Colorado. That's continuing to burn, and I am going to keep picking on that guy. We're basically, he's in kind of a bit of a three-on-one now. Both New Orleanses are picking are picking on him. I'm going to do the same, and right now, as you can see as I come around the island, I'm the one kind of spotting him for the team. Now, I'm expecting an AP salvo in return. I do get the reset, solid damage. Remember, we talked about it in the other in the rest of the video, right? The, the, the Japanese HE versus 32mm upper works means you will get a lot of good full pens. But look at those shells coming in. Those look like AP shells? Nope. He's fired HE at me. Now, he might have just had HE in the barrel, but he's had nothing but cruisers to shoot at for a while. So the next move I'm going to make is going to be a little bit disrespectful and a little bit ballsy. I'm going to go broadside of this guy and make a turn. He's right at the edge of my range. I don't want to lose him. But also, it seems like he's just firing HE. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not afraid of your HE. I'm just not. And yep, sure enough, there it is. The return salvo coming in as high explosive. Now, he might hit me. Yep, he's going to hit me and disable my engine and my rudder. I got to fix that. You know, that's the thing about Battleship HE in a cruiser. It'll knock your engine out or, or you know, it'll mess you up, right? It's sometimes, especially the British Battleship HE will do horrible things. But the overwhelming majority of it will, is just kind of a is kind of a nuisance, right? It's like uh, you not you know you did a little bit of damage, you knocked something out that I didn't want to give up. Now, unfortunately, my last shell arrives just in a, just a hair too late. The ranger burns him out. 
So I'm not able to pick up that kill. But the Scores is gonna has already finished that cap. He's headed down the channel, and we can tell because the uh, U69 is capping C that uh, this uh, we know where he is, right? Three minutes to play, four v two. I'm still looking for that Kraken. I want this Kraken now, man. I want this Kraken. But I want the win more than anything. We've got a uh, 300 and, well, 270-ish point lead or so. And so I'm like, okay, let's just get up here and let's pick the B-cat back up. They can't defend it, right? I've still got my Hydro available if I need to go submarine hunting. And the Carrier can continue to harass the Scores and hopefully put him off the board. Both New Orleanses, though, are very low. They have to be a little they have to be a little careful or they may find themselves on the bottom as well. One to two salvos from the Schoolers could put them out. Schoolers is backing off. I think he's kind of realized the predicament that he's in with both of those New Orleans is shooting at him. And the planes spotting him. He can't quite uh, can't quite escape here. 470 HP. U69 picks up one of the New Orleanses. And so now the gap narrows even more. So we've been, you know, we had a, remember we had a 200 and something point lead. Now down to about 140 points right as I step on the B cap. Between the kill and the significant cap advantage, we probably were on track to lose that game until I, lose this game, I should say, until I got into this cap. A quick, quick glimpse on the scores. He's barely in my range. I've got to take a shot here. I'm going to spread these shells around. Yep, I'm just kind of I'm kind of just vomiting. I only got to hit him with one and I'm just sort of spreading them out trying to get one of them to land on where I think he's headed at that range. Mm, that feels good. That feels good. I'm, I'm pretty proud of that shot. I'm not going to lie, kids. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty proud of that one. Now, again, the scores does take out the opposing New Orleans and so now we're in a 2v1 with the U69. I'm going to slow down long enough to pick up this cap as that's going to hold us open at about a 100-ish point lead with 60 seconds to play. I'm going to cut straight down the cap, uh, sorry, the cap, the channel here, uh, head straight to the C cap. I know the U69 is out, in, is out in front of me somewhere. If he's smart, he's hunting the Ranger. The Ranger should be able to kind of fend him off a bit, right? I mean, there's no submarine in the game that likes planes. And once the Ranger has an idea, if the submarine wanders too close, that automated uh, ASW the carriers have is not too awful bad. So let's see if I can get up here and maybe pick up kill number six. Ooh. I'm kind of waiting. I'm kind of keeping an eye on the minimap. I'm waiting to see if a ping shows up. But it seems like this U69 is either on the surface, not actively pinging, or he's gone deep. You see there... Some rocket planes going out looking for him now. There he is. Catch a glimpse of him. But he is deep now. We're going to lose sight of him with 10 seconds to play. I'm not even going to have time to get into the cap. He is going to finally ping, but of course he's well outside my depth charge range. And that is how this game is going to reach a conclusion. From bottom tier, Furutaka there with, uh, you know, five kills, a nice, a nice Kraken. Whole big pile of damage. I mean, 90,000 damage is perhaps not amazing, but it certainly isn't anything to sneeze at from a Tier 5 heavy cruiser. The handling and detection of this ship will allow you to sneak into places and do things that will surprise you. And it's something you're going to discover more or less up and down the line. But it's a double-edged sword, right? Because once you sort of open fire and reveal yourself, most players, certainly most battleship players, know how squishy... Japanese cruisers tend to be, you're going to draw a lot of hate once they know where to look. So the key is always going to be take a salvo, take a two, you know, make the plays you need to make, and then whew, John Cena it, right? Go back to being dark again, hopefully if you're able, sneak away, reposition, and try and do something a little unexpected. Or when you open up again, try to be where they didn't think you might be, something along those lines. But anyway, solid game. Like we said, 90,000 damage. Uh, we got a Confederate, a, cl <laughs> a close quarters expert in a Furutaka. Uh, a Kraken in a First Blood. Feels good. A uh, whole big pile of XP, right? Almost a little over 2,800 base XP. More than double the Ranger, who played a pretty solid game down there in second place. Just perseverance 
refusal to die <laughs> and um, and kind of shooting things at the right time enables me to have a really, really solid game here. And when you look at the damage screen here, you know, things are spread out. But honestly, that's sort of what you want on a Japanese heavy. You're going to be spending a lot of time as a heavy cruiser. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of singling out, obviously, this is a Furutake game, but really... But almost any heavy cruiser, you're going to be looking for targets of opportunity. You know, the 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 Farragut, the Cachalot, those were targets of opportunity. Certainly the Helenas were. Um, uh, the Scores was just out of necessity. The Colorado was because he was the only thing I had to shoot at, and so on. You, you know, you've only got a salvo every 15 seconds, so you're, you're, you know, you fire twice as fast as a battleship, but you're still not, you're not firing all that quick. you got to make your salvos count, and the Japanese are really good at that with that amazing dispersion that we talked about earlier. All right, guys, there you go. I hope you enjoyed this sample game. I hope you've enjoyed this video about Tier 5 Imperial Japanese Cruiser Furutaka. We will be doing more of these. I've got some uh, some lineup for Alba and Miyoko. We're going to keep going up the line and talking about these ships. I thoroughly enjoy them. They are perhaps a little... Uh, not quite as good as the American cruisers overall. They play differently. They have different strengths. Um, and we're going to talk more about that when we get to Alba. Furutaka is a very good introduction to the line. She's not. She doesn't do anything terribly badly. She doesn't do anything crazy. Um, Alba, I think, is where we're really going to have to spend a little time talking about tactics um, and strategy and how you play the line. And uh, we will definitely be doing that in the next video. But for now, enjoy Furutaka, and I'll see you out there. Take care.